before I started to put into context some of the remarks I'm going to make, let me give you a quick overview of the Royal Bank of Canada. We're probably the largest bank you've never heard of. Um, we're the 15th, in the 15th top global banks in the world. We're the Canada's largest bank. And we very much take our Canadian heritage as part of our services to clients going forward. Our heritage in natural resources, in energy, and in infrastructure. And we have 70 global professionals who advise corporates uh, and funds on buying and selling either the companies or the assets that sit behind those companies in the infrastructure space. On the corporate side, we've invested clients, we advise clients like SSE on the disposal of some of their wind farm assets. And also here in Ireland, we advise Board Gosh on, this, on the sale of its energy business in 2014. And we also advise a lot of the pension funds and infrastructure funds who are looking to acquire these assets right across the infrastructure space. And for them, energy is one part of the overall mix of assets they look at um, on an ongoing basis. We've heard a lot about the investment backdrop in Europe. We're seeing new energy policy and advances in technology are really transforming, as we've heard, the power generation landscape. In particular, we're seeing some of the aging plants being replaced by cleaner, efficient gas plants. We're seeing more and more renewables coming onto the system. We're seeing in some countries nuclear either being progressively phased out altogether or old generators being replaced over the long term with a new generation of reactors going forward. And importantly, we've seen those changes in the technology mix leading to expansion of small-scale decentralized uh, energy generation, which can appeal directly to the consumers as well as we've heard. And this investment background really reflects three areas. One, the evolving market, regulatory conditions we've heard of. We've got the, the push-pull of trying to keep um, down costs for consumers, but trying to ensure we have security of supply. We're seeing the environmental controls on the levels of emissions that we have um, in, our, in our European nations. And we also see the financial incentives have been put in place to invest in low carbon generation. And it's these that are attracting some of this low cost capital into the energy sector. Amory mentioned in, in his earlier uh, address about the impact of the Eurozone crisis on the European utilities. And I don't think we can underestimate that standing where we are today in 2015. We've seen since 2007 this massive fall off in the market caps of the European energy uh, utilities. They've fallen by more than 330 billion. So if you take E.ON for an example, that means they've moved down from a market cap of close to 90 billion to 17 billion today. And equally with RWE, you've seen them move from 52 billion of market cap to 7.5 billion today. Their balance sheets, therefore, are under pressure. The rating agencies are looking at their credit ratings. And they're much more constrained in what they can do as part of this expansion of the energy generation landscape. In particular, they're constrained to follow through on some of the blue sky thinking that otherwise sits within some of these very progressive utilities as well. So there are very large investment opportunities for investors. And they're very attracted to that but they sometimes find the interplay between the markets and the EU and national level policy complex and making what would otherwise be a very attractive investment environment somewhat more uncertain. So how do you attract this low cost capital into the energy sector? Well, the, the good news is that certain subsectors of um, energy are now seen as very much core infrastructure. So we have pension funds, for instance, who are keen to acquire long-term investments to match their long-term pension liabilities, attracted to opportunities in renewables, in transmission, distribution, and even into some of the midstream energy infrastructure that some of the oil and gas majors are now disposing of. Capital is currently in plentiful supply. We are in a low-cost interest rate environment. Investors are looking to, to, to directly invest in real assets in order to improve their returns. So we saw in, in 200, 2014 about 750 infrastructure deals close across uh, the globe, and that's about $450 billion of investment. And we also have a very competitive and liquid debt market post the, the recession and post the financial crisis that's available to support these buyers. 
So together with a low interest rate environment, we're seeing some very attractive valuations for some of these yield-based assets across the mix. And we've also seen the re-emergence of some of the public market, institutional investors now interested in finding ways to direct, directly invest in infrastructure. So we've seen the emergence of some of the yield codes in the US, which have faltered over the summer, but also here in the UK and also in Spain as well. But we have to remember one thing. These investors have lots and lots of choice. They are looking at all of the asset classes across the infrastructure space. So we advised recently CDPQ, a Canadian pension fund who bought a 25% stake in London Array for a billion dollars. But at the same time, they were looking at Eurostar and acquired that, and they also have made an investment in Heathrow Airport. And it's the same fund manager that's looking at all of those direct investments. So we have to be competitive and we have to provide stability and predictability of revenues and costs, and most importantly, a supportive regulatory and political environment. I put a chart up here just to flag some of the key, the general drivers of, of financial investors' risk appetite. And if we take just the, the, the column on the left, the low risk end of the spectrum, we've seen recently uh, investors in the current low interest rate environment buying assets at historic lows. So we're seeing pension funds looking at regulated entities, transmission, distribution, some solar within that as well, which have inflation-linked revenues, strong cash yields, at levered nominal returns of 7 to 9%. It wasn't long ago that some of the utilities in the debt markets were having to borrow at rates not dissimilar to that. And even when we move up to more medium-scale um, risk, wind farms, biomass, we're still seeing returns of between 9 and 11%. Um, so again, still very, very competitive to what we've seen in the past. And we're also seeing lots of new entrants. So we've seen a, a rush of the Canadian pension funds move out of some of the other parts of the infrastructure space, like water utilities, into some of the renewable energy generation. I've mentioned CDBQ. But we obviously also saw Brookfield come in and, and acquire uh, Borgosh's energy, uh, renewable energy business here in Ireland as well and a mix of investors across the whole piece of the energy sector. So moving on to some of the challenges that do exist though, and I'm gonna make two snapshots uh, points for discussion. One is on conventional generation, and the other is on renewable energy. Firstly, on conventional generation, it's quite clear that there is uh, a mid to longer term requirement for new facilities, but the signals are currently, on pricing, are currently insufficient for financial investors to invest. We've got low spark spreads, we've got fall in output, we all know why, we all know the history. But even if you look at, at, at the predictable, predictability around spark spreads looking to recover over, to, over time as demand picks up or as old plants are taken off the system, we still have continuing uncertainty about what prices they're really going to be able to achieve with the influx of renewables on the system, and also what load factors they're going to be able to achieve as well. Capacity mechanisms have offered some certainty, but, but not all, and, and certainly not to the level that some new entrants were hoping for. So in 2014 in the UK, we saw an auction take place, a capacity auction, but the clearing price was below the annual fixed cost of most existing plants. So those plants are going to have to secure other streams of revenue in order to ensure their economic vi viability, really from spark spreads and from system balancing services going forward. And then we look at challenges for renewables. I think in the past, um, renewables were really seen as an invest and forget class of, of assets. So investors put in the upfront capital uh, outlay. It was over a long term. They crossed their fingers. They hoped the weather would perform, and they got a fairly dependable cash flow. But we've seen upsets, as we've mentioned, in Spain in the past, and we're seeing in the UK recently the government change the climate change um, levy and take away the LEX, which has meant for most of the investors in the space a 10% drop in their revenues. And we've also seen political uncertainty, and we've, you know, other people have mentioned about the change of heart in the Tory party and around there about onshore wind. And lots of people have put a lot of money into development that are suffering lots of pain at the moment. And then going forward, I think we're seeing many projects facing the beginning of power market risk, which was unusual for some of those who perhaps had attractive feed-in tariffs in the past. And the trend towards top-up tariffs is taking away some of that market protection. So suddenly we're seeing generators directly exposed to balancing risk, which they're not really equipped to understand or, or take. And we're also seeing some basis risk on the generator's ability to sell its output 
at the market reference rate, whatever rate that's been set um, as, as the price for the top-up tariff. And then going forward, you also see the potential for some negative market prices, which will take away some of the volume certainty that those investors had relied upon in some of their base case. So renewables will still be a, a massive and significant area of focus for investment going forward. The scale of offshore is very attractive to these investments, equally onshore and solar. But these risks aren't straightforward to assess as the market changes. And I do think you may see some of the um, recent valuations and, and very high prices being paid impacted because of that. So what are the challenges for the next decade? How do we create a positive investment environment for energy going forward? I think certainty is, is key. Capital is attracted to certainty and any signals that governments can give about the extent of the commitment it's going to support uh, and also the types of technology it, it would like to have as part of its overall uh, diverse generation mix are going to be very important for investors. I think one thing that's always ignored as well is investors very much focus on the long-term marginal costs as well when they look at their base case business plans. And I don't think there's enough sharing about some of the experiences that we are having, particularly in some of the new, off new technologies. And I take offshore wind as an example, where we really need to share the experiences we have in terms of the cost of maintaining and the performance of these turbines that are out, far out to sea in order to ensure that, that the investors reach their, their return thresholds and get confident to bring their IRR requirements down. And then finally, I think we, we've talked a lot about some early stage technology, about some consumer-led technology. It's still very challenging for these types of large-scale investors to invest in. And we still need to be open that we need government support in some of these areas. And the Green Investment Bank in the UK has been quite helpful in terms of f funding some of the earlier stage technology in order to get investors comfortable uh, to come in behind them as the maturity of the technology is proven. And as we look at the demand side going forward, we've, we've seen a lot about consumption uh, reduction for consumers. We've seen about lots of inspirational ways that consumers should manage their own efficiency going forward and their desire to do that. And also demand control in order to match generation patterns. But we have to be innovative about thinking about large scale opportunities that we can attract this low cost capital into in order to make them part of the story going forward as well. Thank you. <laughs>